Uh, we much appreciate it. Uh, well, the way the program's going to go now is we're going to have a short presentation from our second keynote presenter, uh, Mr. Um, Nadav Kidron, and then afterwards we're going to have a panel presentation where you can ask questions to John, to Nadav, to everybody. They'll be up here. The questions will go, I have questions, but you may want to ask your questions. We'll go straight to the audience. We'll go straight with mics to you guys. So, this, so you have the opportunity to follow up on this and have other speakers as well. So you can actually engage them one-on-one. -on -one. But before we continue, I want to just introduce um, our second keynote, a man named Nadav Kidron, who's the CEO of Ormed Pharmaceuticals. And just a little bit about Nadav. And Nadav is an entrepreneur whose experience includes senior executive roles in a wide range of industries. He's currently the CEO and director of Ormadid Pharmaceuticals, an oral drug delivery company, which he founded in 2006. He is an, on the advisory board member for the Trendelis Group, a group that invests and develops innovative-based businesses. He's a member of the board of directors of Ontario Bio, a joint venture formed by Ormed and DNA Biomedical Solutions. He's an intellectual lecturer. He holds a Bachelor of Law. He is literally considered both in the, in the law and in, in the business world as a leader and an innovator. It is an honor to introduce Mr. Nadav Kidron. Thank you, Charlie. Right. I, I assume since it's a YU event, I would assume it uh, would be okay for me to speak in Hebrew, right? <laughs> When I went up the elevator uh, with the Blumenthal's, so they started speaking Hebrew to me. So I said, uh, how come you speak Hebrew? They said, we went to yeshiva. So I said, fine, good, so I'll be able to speak in Hebrew for a change. What I want to do over the next few minutes, I want to touch on a little bit of a different angle than John's angle. I want to take a few specific stories of few specific companies and just share those specific stories with you, and I'll tell you why I chose each one. And by the way, one of the interesting things is when you speak about Israel, I'm looking around my peers, the guys who went with me to law school, and almost no one from the guy who was, you know, among my friends is actually is a lawyer. Most of them are entrepreneurs, you know, like Amiad and uh, Aviro and some other. It's, it's quite amazing to see. So just before we go into the specific companies, I want to touch one slide about the, the Israel mentality. Uh, I think there's no doubt that what makes Israel so unique is to do with our mentality. And I like to give this example of being non-formal. As you can see, I had to wear a tie here today. And it always reminds me of the story that when I went to my law firm on the first day, when I went to work there, they had a huge case at the Supreme Court. And in Israel, when you go to the Supreme Court, you have to put a gun and a tie. But there's a problem, because as Israelis, we don't know how to put the tie on. But our law firm was made out of very smart people, and they had a great idea. They said, you know what, we're going to tie a tie, and we're going to hang it, and whoever needs to go can take the tie, and he can go, and he's ready to go. So I'm getting in there, and what I'm seeing is one of the partners about to go to the Supreme Court, a huge case against, uh, against the Ministry of Education. He happened to be a very tall guy, and it happened to be that the guy who tied the tie was a very short guy, so he has a tie up to here, <laughs> and he's all excited, ready to go. It was my first day on the job, and I was like, I don't know if it's right for me to say something. You know, I lived a little bit abroad, so I know it's not the appropriate way to go. <laughs> I went over to one of the female lawyers. I said, listen, I think, uh, I think Yoni's tie is not 100% okay. So <laughs> she went over there. She was an associate. He was a partner. She gave him a piece of her mind, and you realized what Israel chutzpah is. <laughs> Let's start with this part from a visit in Israel. Don't want to do a photo with me? You can hold my gun. I use it in Entebbe. I give three Ugandans. No, thanks. Before you go in, you fill out comment card. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey, don't forget the back. You people are so pushy. What, Israeli people are pushy? How about you experience a couple of genocides and see how laid back you are? We were perished from Spain. Throw out of there. They allow everybody in Spain, but for us, Jews, no flamenco, get out. I'm pushy, please, you stay there, surrounded by your great enemy, Canada, try Syria, then you stay pushy. So usually when I go around the world and people say, where are you from? And, you know, usually they can tell by the accent, Israel. So I get to hear about all the different things, what they think about Israelis. Pushy and chutzpah here often. Okay, let's talk about one exciting company that I think most of you are familiar with. And I think it's a very, very unique company. John mentioned that there are 80 exits a year. 
And there is a big debate, and maybe we'll discuss it later, whether exit is the right way to go, or should we build and start new companies? This company took a strategy they do, don't want to sell out. And they actually started marketing and selling in the United States with a huge vision. Watch the following. The vision of PowerMet, it's still in the beginning. Uh, how many of you have heard of PowerMet? Okay, everyone. The idea of PowerMet is that they're going to transform the way we live our lives. What they want to do is today you need to have this special thing you put on it. The idea is that the cell phone companies and the laptop companies will produce this building. And we, you're going to buy furniture and you're going to put your cell phone on the furniture next to you, it's going to get charged. We're going to go to a restaurant and you're going to put the cell phone on the table, it's going to get charged. You're going to put it in your house, on the wall, it's going to get charged. The idea is to create a world where electricity is not going to be a power, is not going to be a limitation. And as cell phones get more and more and more advanced, they consume more and more energy, and we have to come with something that will change the world, and they're on the way to making it a reality. Now, this is a tougher one. How many of you are, 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 have heard of Waze? That's not bad, not bad. Um, usually in America, people are not so familiar with it, but for the third of you are not familiar with it, watch the following. If you're a commuter, then every time you get into your car, you're probably wondering about the best way to get to where you need to be. Usually, there are several routes to choose from, and the only thing you're missing is information about what's happening out there on the road as you decide which way you'll travel today. The good news is that the information you need is already out there. Take, for example, the neighbor who left for work about 10 minutes before you. She's already over there on the 101, but she's stuck in traffic. What if you could get a live report from her and dozens of others also along your route as you decide which way you'll go? Well, you can. Meet ways a social mobile application that we and our Waze network of drivers are building to give you a snapshot of the road at any given moment and the most optimized route to your destination. Last week, my uncle, who is a big rabbi in Yerushalayim, he said, listen, I'm, I have to drive out of town, and uh, your mother told me that I can borrow your GPS. I said, sure. I said, I don't use the GPS anymore. He says, what do you mean? I said, GPS is old stuff. He said, what do you mean? I told him about Waze. He couldn't believe it that... It's something that know on time what's going on with the traffic. Now, in Israel, I don't know how many of you have tried ways in Israel. The idea is obviously that the more users you have, the more data you have, the more accurate it is. In Israel, I think it's probably one of the most unbelievable things. And if my uncle will hear me speaking about ways, he would think I'm speaking about God. Because when you go on the road and he tells you, you're going to get to your destination in this and this minute, and you're getting there exactly on time, and every time I'm testing it again and again, and it's working so well, you almost think, what is going on there? But what's interesting about it is that the technology is about the idea of the power of all is more than the power of one. The founder of the company started it in 2008 when he got a present, a GPS, and he looked at the maps in the GPS and said, this is so outdated. Recently, they got up to, to the top because Apple CEO made an announcement that they failed with their map application, and one of the names he gave as an alternative is Waze, and their market in the United States went from 7% to 10%. <laughs> 28 million users use Waze today, and they have 3 million new users a month. If you don't have it, you should definitely try it. Let's move a little bit into the health world. This is also something which almost sounds like a dream. People who used to be in a wheelchair can now have new life giving to them. If you haven't heard of this, watch the following.
It took her 16 days to finish the marathon. All her life, she was in a wheelchair. And thanks to this Israeli invention, people who wouldn't know what it means to get off the wheelchair, their life is now changing. You can actually start buying it now for $73,000, not in the United States yet, but in Europe, you can already go and buy it. And people's lives will be changed forever. We don't have much left, but this one, I think, is one of the most interesting ones. Uh, John mentioned bright source. There's a lot about solar energy. And uh, one of the old things that we have, which is probably new, is when you go to Israel and you see all the Dud Shemesh, and you realize how much energy we're saving by using the Dud Shemesh. One brilliant idea is the following idea. And I'm about to do a trial with the Sears Tower. Watch the following. In vertical curtain wall applications, the PBGU replaces traditional insulated glass units. Unlike solar panels, the PBGU integrates easily into conventional building architecture and construction processes, and its high transparency enables aesthetically pleasing facade designs. What's more, it delivers the highest power density of any other building integrated photovoltaic solution, generating up to four times more electricity. The PBG also creates a new level of comfort in a building's interior. Standard windows let in harsh sunlight and excessive heat. In contrast, the PBGU provides optimal natural lighting for workspaces, minimizing the use of artificial lighting during daytime hours, saving energy and enhancing productivity. The PBGU manages solar heat gain without tinting or manual shading. This maintains the work environment at a comfortable temperature. All this while reducing reliance on centralized cooling systems, one of the largest sources of building energy consumption and cost. Again, a very simple idea. You may as well have, you have a building, you have the building coated with mirrors, why not use those mirrors to create energy? It sounds such a simple idea and yet they're doing it now and the idea is that you can have self-sufficient buildings. You can have a skyscraper and basically you're gonna use the mirror outside in order to allow sufficient energy in the building. Another great idea, by the way, that I saw the company, but I don't think they made a video. One of these ideas that you say, how come nobody thought about it beforehand? It's an Israeli company that came to an incubator I'm involved with, and they said, we have the following idea. When someone is about to take a shower, at least in Israel, the way it works is, you have to take the water and you have to use some water until you know that you got the right temperature and it's warm enough. What they said is they have a very beautiful thing that you know that you want to shower at whatever, 25 Celsius degrees. So you do 25, and you only get the water out when it's reached that heat level that you want it to get. So there's no waste of water. There's no all this standing there knowing it's warm enough, cold enough, whatever it is, and you're saving all this water and energy. It's such a simple idea. I think the technology is probably not so complicated. And you're standing out and you say, how come nobody thought about it beforehand? Okay, this is a good one, and this is where I'm happy to say that I'm, I'm at the age that I'm not going as much to the army that I used to go in the past. And the idea is that they created, WaterGen has created a technology that basically takes the humidity, takes the water out of the humidity in the air and produces water. They have something that you can put in a tank, and then you don't have to worry about schlepping the water and getting it to the soldiers who are in the tank. And the other thing that they have, which I think is a good thing, unless you're the soldier who has to carry it out, is that they have this portable thing that you can actually put it on a soldier. It can make up to 300 liters as we go and on one battery. And they have another two sets of batteries. So altogether, it can produce 900 uh, liters of water, and you just make it out from the air. One time, I went in an office building in Tel Aviv, and they had a demonstration. They put this machine there in the lobby not connected to anything, and everybody that came in, they said, here, we'll give you a cup of water. Everybody got a cup of water, and all of it was made out of the humidity in the air. This thing has a potential to be a real, real game changer. This is just to show you that not everything is about high tech. Some of it has to do just with the spirit. There was uh, a guy, his name is Dror, that he wanted to put plant on his balcony he tried to put it inside, but he lived in Tel Aviv, and he took too much space. Tried to put it on the outside, you know, he couldn't enjoy it. So he came out with the idea of Greenbow, which he made this type of plant that you can put it in the middle, 
And they, they started off by getting there's a fund in Israel that they gave them a few hundred of thousands to start off. Today they sell for a few million of dollars a year. They won a few international prizes and they're doing very, very well. So this is just to show you that the spirit doesn't have to be with very complicated, sophisticated inventions. Sometimes if you come up with a good idea and you have the initiative and the energy to push it, you can go very far with it. Okay, this is one before the last one. This is also another crazy idea. This guy who started it, his name is Dr. Shabtai. He used to work uh, in the Israeli Air Force and he had this dream of producing this machine. I'll show you what the machine does and then I'll tell you the rest of the story. The vehicle is extremely compact, about the size of a large van, which gives it the ability to land in virtually any urban space. As a result of its unique maneuverability, the range of missions that XHawk is able to fulfill is virtually limitless. Equipped as an aerial ambulance, its response time is rapid, predictable, and unaffected by contingencies such as traffic jams. In circumstances where minutes can make all the difference, XHawk can save lives. So this is the idea is that he was able to create that technology which somebody already thought of during the 50s, how instead of a helicopter, you can have something which can go up like that, can go all over the place. And he built the first model in his living room. He was the first pilot to try it out. He was the first guy to fund the company. And now there are a few different models and they try to go uh, further with it. We'll have to watch how well it will go, but he definitely has a tremendous potential. I'm just gonna add two slides about my own personal story. I happened to grow up in a house where my mother was a scientist at the Medical Center. And seven years ago, she told me that they had a breakthrough and they have a technology that can enable us to take insulin orally. And uh, I told her, listen, it has a huge upside besides helping millions of people out there. And I went over to Adassa, negotiated with them, took the intellectual property out of the hospital and established the company. And since then, we've done a lot of work uh, in the last few years, and thanks to a great team that we have. And now we're about to enter a big trial in the United States, the phase two uh, on the oral insulin in the United States. And beyond that, we're also working on some other products besides insulin, where basically we can take injections and deliver them orally. Sometimes it's good because of the patient's compliance, but many times it's also good because it has some physiological advantages. So through that experience, I got to be familiar with our company and with many other company. I was very happy to be part of this Israel startup innovation experience. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of it. <laughs>